American troops arrive in France on July 12, 1917. Georges Fulpin, a teacher in saint eugie Elementary School in the Parisian, the city's Malte district, and the idea was to incorporate the unfolding events into a class assignment, asking students ages 8 to 13 to sketch and write about their reactions to the war and to the sudden presence of American soldiers in their hometown. This drawing exercise produced around 1,300 drawings, which were conserved in the Vallou Montmartre Historical and Archaeological Society. The results offer an insight to the psyche of wartime France like few photographs or news reports can. Through innocent eyes, the complexities of geopolitics are reduced to fundamental notions of transatlantic solidarity, the specter of looming violence, and daily life at a precarious moment in history. At the end of the study of this unit, the American history student should be able to answer these following focus questions. One, what caused the outbreak of the Great War and why did the United States join the conflict? What was distinctive about the fighting of the Western Front? Two, how did the Wilson administration mobilize the home front? How did these mobilizations efforts affect society. 3. What were the major events of the war after the United States entered the conflict? How did the American war efforts contribute to the defeat of the Central Powers? 4. How did Wilson promote the plans for a peaceful world order as outlined in his 14 points? And 5. What were the consequences of the war at home and abroad? Uneasy Neutrality Alliances Before the War Competing imperial ambitions that had led to economic rivalries, military alliances, and diplomatic maneuvering had divided Europe into two blocks. Germany's alliance system was a defense against future wars with France. In 1872, the Three Emperors League of Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia formed to preserve peace between the Austrian and Hungarians in Russia and to isolate Germany's enemy, France. It was renewed secretly in 1881. Kaiser Wilhelm I attended to make Germany dominant in world affairs, and a defense alliance was completed with Austria-Hungary in 1879. The Triple Alliance Italy joined in 1882, making the Triple Alliance renewed in 1891, 1902, and 1907. In 1888, when Wilhelm I died, he was replaced by his son Frederick III, who also died even Wilhelm II as Emperor of Germany. Wilhelm II let the alliance with Russia slide. In 1896, the Kruger telegram, Wilhelm II congratulated Paulus Kruger, President of the Boer Republic of the Transvaal in South Africa, on defeating Britain in the early steps of the Boer War, an action viewed angrily as German interference. The purpose of this treaty was defensive. If France or Russia attacked Germany, then Italy and the Austro-Hungarian Empire would declare war on them. Then came the Triple Entente. To balance the new German threat, traditional antagonistic powers allied France and Russia began negotiating an alliance in 1891, completed by 1894, to remain in force as long as the Triple Alliance remained in force. Britain and France formed the Entente, Cordial in 1904. Russia joined the alliance in 1907, forming the Triple Entente. Similar to the Triple Alliance, it was a defensive treaty. For example, if Austria-Hungary attacked Russia, Great Britain and France would declare war on Austria and Hungary. What seemed to be a perfect alliance to avoid war was a recipe for total war on the European continent. The Balkan Crisis a struggle between Russia and Austria developed over the control of the Serbian states. A previous secret agreement between Austria and Serbia in 1881 resulted in Austria aiding Serbia in a war with Bulgaria in 1885. By 1888, a pro-Austrian faction within Serbia battled a pro-Russian faction for control of the Serbian government. In 1904, as Serbia grew more nationalistic and anti-Austrian, Russia promoted the idea of regional independence. Bosnia-Herzegovina. In 1908, Austria annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina and would not allow Russian warships to sail through the Dardanelles. 
Serbia sought an alliance with Turkey and Greece against Austria. The desire for independence from Austria and the possibility of aid from Russia raised the prospects of war in the region. Members of the terrorist group the Black Hand also lived in Serbia. The false sense of security averting an international crisis through diplomacy gave Europe a false sense of security, believing war could not happen because of the new balance of power in Europe. New fierce weaponry also acted as a deterrent towards war. The Spark The heir to the Habsburg throne, the Crown Prince of Austria-Hungary, was the Archduke Francis Ferdinand, and his wife Sophie were traveling through Bosnia. Although warned not to go, Ferdinand wanted the peace, a political reform. He believed a war with Serbia was foolish, believing that it would get a lot of good men killed for nothing. On June 28, 1914, early in the day, there was an attempt to assassinate the Crown Prince by lobbing bombs at the convoy, but failed. Instead of going along the river road, which would have been faster, and he instead drove through the city of Sarajevo. Serbian nationalist Gabriel Princet, a member of the terrorist organization Black Hand, who had stopped to order a sandwich, would end up assassinating both when the lead driver of the convoy had stopped because he had missed his turn. Princet was caught and sentenced to 20 years, as you see in the photograph below. At this point, Austria-Hungary, with the backing of Germany, were more than willing to take a greater risk, hoping for a local war in July, which would be over soon. Austria-Hungary blamed Serbia and the issues of ultimatum to Serbia, which Serbia would regret, but they would offer negotiation and declare war. Russia would mobilize their army to protect what it was considered a sister nation. So the question to, to ask, who's to blame to start this great war? The answer would be the Austria-Hungarian Empire. Fighting erupts. The war would quickly escalate due to alliances. On July 28th, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. Russia mobilizes, and this threatens Austria. On July 29th, Germany would demand Russia to stop. On July 31st, Germany delivers an ultimatum to France to stop their mobilization. On August 1st, Germany declares war on Russia and France continues to mobilize. On August 3rd, Germany declares war on France, moves through neutral Belgium by the von Schlieffen plan. On August 4th, Great Britain will declare war on Germany. And it was that quickly that the, there will be a war in Europe. The first time that all of the continent of Europe was at war since the Napoleonic Wars that ended in 1815. The alliances, the central powers, consisted of Austria, Hungary, Germany, and the Ottoman Empire. The name of Triple Alliance is dropped due to Italy leaving the alliance and the powers were centrally located. Bulgaria would then join, hoping it could gain some territory out of Serbia. The Allied powers consist of Great Britain, France, Russia, Serbia, and Japan. And looking at that, you're like, Japan? How's Japan involved? Well, J Japan would formally declare war on Germany on August 23rd 1914 after being promised concessions from the Allies. Japanese forces quickly occupied a German leased territories in the Far East. On September 2, 1914, Japan's forces landed on China's Shandong province and surrounded the German settlement of Sing Tao. Italy, once a member of the Triple Alliance, broke and joined the Allied powers, claiming the alliance was a defensive alliance, and since Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire declared war, they were therefore aggressive, and now Italy was not obligated to join them. Italy as also was promised a large section to be carved out of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, 
once the Central Powers were defeated. Romania had been allied with the Triple Alliance, the Central Powers, since 1882. When the war began, however, it declared its neutrality, arguing that because Austria-Hungary had itself declared war on Serbia, Romania was under no obligation to join the war. When the Entente powers promised Romania large territories of eastern Hungary, Transylvania, and Banat, and had a large Romanian population exchange for Romanians declaring war on the Central Powers, the Romanian government announced its neutrality, and on August 27, 1916, the Romanian army launched an attack against Austro-Hungary with limited Russian support. An industrial war, a global war. As nations entered the war, they pulled their global empires in with them. The powers expected their resources, both economic and human, to help with the war effort. In the decades preceding this war, the speed of militarization, industrialization, and a global competition for economic and imperial control had led to the development of technologies that contributed to the scale of human suffering and destructiveness of the Great War. New weapons were introduced in this war. The airplane first served as a surveillance to drop bombs, and finally they were attacked with machine guns. Manfred von Richthofen, the famous Red Baron, would shoot down 80 Allied aircraft. Poison gas. Chlorine gas, invented by Fritz Haber, a future Nobel Prize winner in chemistry in 1918, for his development of fertilizers, introduced by the Germans on April 22nd of 1915. During the Second Battle of Yerps, the German army opened numerous chlorine gas canisters by hand and allowed the wind to carry the gas towards the French positions. Thousands of French soldiers died, choking on the gas, while others were forced from their trenches and shot down by enemy gunfire. Some survived by urinating in their handkerchiefs, since chlorines were soluble, so soldiers without a mask could cover their nose and mouth with a wet rag for somewhat effective uh, protection. It was actually the ammonia in the urine that really protected them. Although one of World War I's most horrible weapons, poison gas was not one of the deadliest. Very few soldiers who were gassed died, probably somewhere under 5%. Mustard gas, getting its name because of the yellow hue, would be developed and delivered by artillery shells. Masks and other protective devices were developed to protect horses, mules, dogs, and even carrier pigeons. The tank, introduced by the British in 1916 at the Battle of the Somme, proved to be clumsy and slow. and received its name because it looked like a water tank. The Western Front Overconfidence All sides believe that the war will be over by Christmas. Delusions of grandeur Due to a world grown old and cold and weary, the last time the entire European continent was at war was with one another was in the Napoleonic Wars that ended in 1815. The von Schlieffen Plan. In case Germany faced a two-front war with France and Russia, the plan called for a quick strike to knock out France, who had one of the best trained professional armies before Russia could adequately mobilize with their conscript peasant army. Early on, the plan worked. Germany had swept through Belgium, heading for Paris, and by September 3rd, Germany was on the edge of Paris. The Battle of the Marne was the first major clash on the Western Front in one of the most important events in the war and was a turning point of World War I. By the end of August 1914, the whole Allied army on the Western Front had been forced into a general retreat back towards Paris. Meanwhile, the two main German armies continued through France. It seemed that Paris would be taken as the Allies fell backwards towards the Marne River. French troops were transported by 600 Parisian taxicabs to the front. The arrival of the British Expeditionary Force quickly mobilized, and with the French commander, General Joseph Joffre, halts the German advance and drives the Germans back 60 miles. The war would become a stalemate when the Allied powers won the Battle of the Marne. 
The German retreat left the Schlieffen plan in ruins, and Germany had no hope of a quick victory in France. Its army was left to fight a long war on two fronts. As Russia invaded Germany, and Germany was forced to send troops to the east to counter Russia. The casualties. Over two million fought, men fought in the First Battle of the Marne. Estimates for the actions of September along the Marne front for all armies were given at around 500,000 killed or wounded, 80,000 French, and 67,700 Germans were killed in action. This is beginning of one of the bloodiest wars in human history. To help you better understand the horrors of what it was like to fight in the First World War, first let's take a look at this diagram in the trench. In the lower left-hand corner, what you will see is you will see a British soldier here overlooking the trench. Notice he's on an area, this is called a step up. Now below it is the foot of the trench. Sometimes this would fill up with water and make it very difficult for soldiers because their feet would constantly stay wet and they're introduced to a new disease. This disease is gonna be called trench foot. Next, we'll explore the series of trenches. Here in trench A is the frontline trench. Here we also see in the frontline trench, you have two soldiers manning machine gun nest. Now behind trench A is trench B, and this is the communication trench. Here, and as you look at this little area right here that I just highlighted, that is the dugout. These could be many meters deep, and which also could be the headquarters. It also could serve as an area for soldiers to sleep in. The communications trench is supposed to observe what is going on the front line, and if need to, communicate back to artillery if they needed some artillery strikes. This was usually done in three ways. One, carrier pigeon, two, a runner, or three, it was done with telephone lines. And then behind them is the reserve trench. These are the soldiers who had previously been in the front line trench for one week. They're now placed in reserves for another week, and they would fill in the front line troops as well. Now let's see what would happen when soldiers tried to take this area. So we're using the German side D. What they would first begin is with artillery strikes to try to soften up trench A and get the men to get out of their trenches and to hide out, maybe do enough significant damage, as we can see here. The next step would be called going over the top. The officer would blow their whistle and men would get out of the trenches and then try to head towards the enemy front line. Here we'll see it's the British or the French lines. Okay. Now, as the German soldiers are trying to make their way over what is called no man's land, what we will see is various obstacles that are gonna stand in their way. First and foremost is the land itself. Since it's been shot up by mostly artillery fire, as you can see in these little craters located right here, these craters could also fill up with water. This could make this area very muddy. If that wasn't bad enough, the next thing they have to do is just try to negotiate and get through these uh, barbed wire or Constantine wire that are many, many feet deep. Now, after trying to soften up, of course, the British soldiers would then come out of their trenches and then begin to fire. As you can see, this uh, triangle that I'm drawing, this is traversing fire. So they're under machine gun fire. The communication trench would then call back to the artillery and then artillery is then lobbed down into no man's land. Now, artillery had already know the effective range and the communications trench and those on the front line would tell where the Germans are trying to take over on the trenches. Hence, this was called no man's land because no man could obviously get through it. Due to this, attacks were usually done early in the morning 
and a new aspect of warfare is introduced, fighting at night. It was not long before the war deteriorated into trench warfare with both sides in a bloody stalemate, mostly on the Western and Italian fronts. Both sides used a vast amount of resources in large militaries to try to wear down the enemy and exhaust enemy resources. The horrors of the trench has impacted soldiers both physically and psychologically. The Western Front was 10 miles wide, stretching from the English Channel to the Swiss border. The Italian Front was fought mostly in the Alps. Diseases were widespread in the trenches, cholera, dysentery. Dead bodies brought rats to the trench. On December 7, 1914, Pope Benedict XV suggested a temporary hiatus of the war for the celebration of Christmas. The warring countries refused to create any official ceasefire, but on Christmas, the soldier in the trenches declared their own unofficial truce. In one part of the line, British soldiers saw lights going up on the Christmas Eve on the German side of no man's land. They were expecting a night attack. Then they heard singing, Stili Nacht, Heilige Nacht, Silent Night, Holy Night, and noticed that the Germans were lighting Christmas trees. The British, not to be undone, responded with, God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Both would get out of their trenches and celebrate Christmas, sharing their food parcels of fresh bread, sausages, and beer. In some areas, they played a game of soccer and buried their dead. It was never repeated. Future attempts at holiday ceasefires were quashed by officers' threats of disciplinary action. But it served as a heartening proof, however brief, that beneath the brutal clash of weapons, the soldiers' essential humanity endured. Bloody Warfare Battles created a high number of casualties. Casualties is the measure of the number of dead, wounded, missing, and captured. In the Battle of Verdun in 1916, a German offensive, it was fought between German and French armies from 21st of February 1916 to 18 December on a hilly terrain north of the city of Verdun, sur Moise, in the northeastern France. Verdun resulted in 306,000 battlefield deaths, 143,000 for the French and 163,000 were German combatants, an average of 30,600 deaths for each of the 10 months of the battle. It was the longest and one of the most devastating battles in the First World War in the history of warfare. Verdun was primarily an artillery battle. A total of about 40 million artillery shells were exchanged, leaving behind millions of overlapping shell crater craters that are still partially visible. In both France and Germany, Verdun has become and represent the horrors of the war. And it solved nothing. And the Battle of the Somme was a British campaign. The British drove five miles the first day at the cost of 20,000 men killed in action. From July 1st through 18 November 1916, the Battle of the Somme was one of the largest battles of the war. By the time fighting paused in late autumn 1916, the forces involved had suffered more than one million casualties, making it one of the bloodiest military operations ever recorded. The conduct of the battle has been a source of controversy. Senior officers such as General Sir Douglas Haig, the commander of British Expeditionary Force, and Henry Rawlson, the commander of the 4th Army, have been criticized for incurring very severe losses while failing to achieve their territorial objectives. Other historians have portrayed the Somme as a vital preliminary to the defeat of the German army and one which taught the British Army valuable tactical and operational lessons. The total battle deaths were 310,486, 146,431 for the Allies, and 164,055 for the Germans. The Eastern Front, the Battle of Tannenberg, 
General Paul von Hindenburg would defeat the Russians in Tannenberg, forcing them out of Germany. Russia suffered 170,000 casualties, 92,000 of them were taken as prisoners of war. Germany, only 12,000. Unlike the Western Front, the Eastern Front was, had more mobility and less trench warfare. On the Eastern Front, the Germans and the Austrians would repel the Russians out of Galicia and 300 miles into Russia. While Germany gains the upper hand over the Russian troops, the Austrian army pushes Russia out of Austria-Hungary. Without modern technology, the Russian army hangs on through sheer strength and numbers and just keeps sending men to the front to attack, attack, and attack. The Middle East, the Battle of Gallipoli, April 1915. The British Empire, consisting of British, Canadian, New Zealanders, and Australian soldiers, would attempt to break through the Balkans and secure the Dardanelles Straits. They landed on the wrong beach and never met their objectives and were soundly defeated. On May 1915, Italy would enter the war. Bulgaria would enter the war in September of 1915 on the side of the Central Powers and they would help eliminate with Austria-Hungary Serbia from the war. Lawrence of Arabia incited Arab princes to revolt against the Ottomans in 1917. At the Battle of Aqaba, Lawrence and the Arab forces of Sharif Hussein in 1917, making the territory the part of the Kingdom of Hejaz under the rule of Prince Faisal. The capture of Aqaba helped open supply lines from Egypt to Arab and British forces afield further north in Transjordan and Greater Palestine and more importantly, alleviated a threat of a Turkish offensive in the strategically important Suez Canal.